Amen and good morning. I love being with you and worshiping the Lord with you this morning. And we're going to talk about the kingdom of God because that's what Jesus talks about in this story this morning. He talks about the kingdom of God and the issues here are pertaining to the gospel and how one must inherit the kingdom. If I were to give this message a title, I would call it the kingdom exchange. And I think that we see that in the story of the rich young ruler, which we'll get into this morning, the kingdom exchange. But first, a little overview, these two stories that we just heard from Mark 10, 13 through 31, they take place in a region that is just east of Jerusalem beyond the Jordan River, the same place we were last week when we had our story on Jesus teaching about marriage and divorce. These stories take place while Jesus is making his final trip from the northern city of Galilee down to Jerusalem. And this would be his last time to make this trip before he would be crucified and rise again. So before they enter Jerusalem on this last and final visit, there's an important lesson that Jesus wants his disciples to learn pertaining to the kingdom of God. Specifically, Jesus wanted to teach them how a person must inherit the kingdom of God. You see, contrary to popular belief in our world today, there is only one way to inherit the kingdom of God. There are not multiple ways to God, but just one way to receive the kingdom of God. Of God. So, what Jesus does is he uses these two experiences in this region to help his disciples learn what must occur in order for a person to receive God's kingdom. And those two experiences that that he uses to teach this lesson are the two stories that we just heard this morning the story of Jesus welcoming the children and the story of the rich young ruler. Those are the two distinct stories, but really these two stories are one. They happen in the same place, in the same sequence in Mark's gospel and Matthew's gospel. And the lesson, it runs, the thread runs through both of these stories. And the driving question of these stories is this. According to Jesus, his opinion is the one that really matters to us, right? According to Jesus... How must a person receive the kingdom of God? Well, before we answer that question, it's important for us to do our best to understand what is the kingdom of God? And specifically, what did Jesus mean when he was talking about the kingdom of God and teaching his disciples these lessons? Because at the time that this story was happening, it was before the crucifixion and resurrection. So the disciples did not really understand yet what the kingdom of God was. It's it's hard for us sometimes to put ourselves in the middle of the story, in the timeline where it's at. So do your best to to put yourself in these disciples' shoes. They didn't have the experience of the uh, the crucifixion or the resurrection or Jesus' ascension or the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They were trying to grasp what this Messiah, based on the the Old Testament in the Roman Empire was here to accomplish. And the disciples, even though Jesus was talking about the kingdom of God, the disciples didn't quite know what he was talking about yet. They thought the kingdom that Jesus came to establish would be a lot like the other kingdoms that were already existing in this world. They thought that Jesus had come to overthrow the Roman Empire that ruled over Israel back at that particular time when this, these stories occurred. And so it wouldn't be until later when they could understand the kingdom of God in the way that Jesus was talking about it in this story. But Jesus knew exactly what the kingdom of God is and what it would be upon the earth, what it would look like, what would characterize it, what would define it. And so he was trying to help his disciples gain some insight so that they could shift their view from the incorrect view that they had currently to the correct view of what the kingdom really is. What is that kingdom? Well, God's kingdom is not limited by borders or by geographical location. It's not restricted by limited resources. It's not constrained to a specific people group, bloodline or nationality or race. It's not weakened 
by the limitations of imperfect leaders and flawed institutions. Are you already more excited about this kingdom than anything we have in America right now? And I'm just getting started on defining the kingdom. Right now, right here in this moment, in this room, the kingdom of God exists presently. Right here, it's present and physically on the earth. And you say, how is that? I thought we were in America. I thought we were in Oklahoma. The kingdom of God presently exist right now in the hearts of men and women who have pledged allegiance to follow Jesus as their king. That is where the kingdom of God exists physically on the earth. And that is what the kingdom of God is. Greater than any physical kingdom, God's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. And I know we, we see money and, and buildings and governments and we think that those things are great because they're tangible and we can see them. I want you to understand the spiritual realm is greater than this realm. And the kingdom of God is not a physical kingdom. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. It knows no limits or boundaries. How about that? Its resources cannot be exhausted because it is, the resources of God's kingdom are supplied by the infinite, limited resources of God. Not only that, but the citizens of this kingdom are, are strange. They're weird. They are unique, a peculiar people as one passage of scripture puts it. The citizens of this kingdom are not united by their nationality or by the color of their skin. Their unity is not based on their common ancestry or their fleshly identities and what is valued in the culture around them. No, the citizens of God's kingdom are one people and completely united, but it's not based on any of the things that generally unite people in this world and fall short of truly uniting us. The citizens of this kingdom are united because they are one in Christ Jesus. That's, there's tons of scripture that talks about this. One verse to show it, Galatians 3, 26 through 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Is that not addressing nationality and your people type? There is neither slave nor free, your social economic status. There is neither male nor female, your identity in the flesh for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There's the unity of the kingdom. It doesn't come from the identities of our flesh. It comes from the identity of the king and the presence of the king in our lives. The people who belong to this kingdom are called the children of God. They are the family of God. They are brothers and sisters and God is their father. What a wonderful kingdom to be a part of. And this is the kingdom that Jesus wanted his disciples to receive. He came to establish this kingdom. And in these lessons, he taught us, all of us, how one must receive this kingdom. So with that understanding of the kingdom of God and what Jesus knew the kingdom of God was and that these disciples would in just a few weeks, learn for themselves what the kingdom of God is. With that view in mind, we're ready to, to discover the lessons from Jesus in this passage in Mark 10, 13 through 31, about how a person must receive that kingdom. And Mark 10, 13 through 31 begs us to ask two questions about the kingdom of God. So these are the two questions we will ask this morning. According to Jesus, first, how is it impossible how is it impossible to inherit the kingdom of God? And then second, how must we receive the kingdom of God? So those are our questions that will guide us through these stories. Let's look at the first one. How is it impossible to inherit the kingdom of God? Well, if we will turn to the story of the rich young ruler, then Jesus will answer that question for us in this story, how it is impossible for a person to inherit the kingdom of God. So let's look at that story first. Here in this passage in Mark, we find a man who seems eager to seek God. He comes running up. I'll put the scripture on the screen behind me and you have your Bible open there as well. We find this man eager. He's running up to Jesus. Mark describes him as earnestly seeking out Jesus and bowing down at Jesus' feet. Clearly this man wanted to receive something from Jesus. And in his opening question, the man reveals the intention of his quest. 
and why he is there at the feet of Jesus. He asks, and this is a loaded question that reveals a lot about this man and about his worldview about Jesus and the kingdom. He asks, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Look at that for a moment. First, he asks, what must I do? From the start, and Jesus recognized it, this man's focus was on the works that he could perform to earn for himself eternal life. He wants Jesus to tell him what he must do to receive it. He's a well-off man. He's accomplished many things. He's got his life in order. He's wealthy, according to the story. This guy's got some stuff together. Just tell me, Jesus, what's the works that I need to do? What do I need to add to my life in order to inherit eternal life? And then second, in his opening question, we see how, how this rich young ruler is relating to Jesus. In other words, what's his worldview of Jesus? Who does he consider Jesus to be? Is he God incarnate? Or is he something else? Well, here's how the man addresses Jesus. He says, good teacher or good rabbi. Now I want you to hang on to that address because the response of Jesus and what he says right after the man answers this question might at first have us scratching our heads. But if we'll remember what the man asked and how the man addressed Jesus, Jesus' response will make a lot more sense to us. So Jesus' response may seem strange at first, but let's look at it. He says, why do you call me good? There is no one good except God. Now there are an antagonist of the faith who will point right here to this verse and argue that Jesus himself must not have seen himself as perfectly righteous or perfectly good. That he must have seen himself as a flawed person and that Jesus did not consider himself to be God. After all, in this question, he says, why do you call me good? There's no one good except for God. But we saw it last week in the teaching of Jesus on marriage and divorce, and we're seeing it again this week, just how dangerous and foolish and even just ignorant of the scriptures it can be for a person to take one line out of the Bible right out of its context, and then to make a universal point, uh, point and share that with other people. No, we must always seek the whole counsel of God if we're going to understand what the word of God is communicating to us. So based on the teaching of Jesus and his, and his apostles, it would be foolish for us to include nothing less then Jesus Christ is absolutely perfect, absolutely righteous, and absolutely God. The scripture communicates that Jesus is the righteous lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The scripture communicates that he alone in heaven and on earth was found worthy to break the seal and open the scroll. The scriptures communicated that he is the word of God that was present in the beginning with God and that was God. And the scriptures communicate that the a fullness of God was pleased to dwell. All of God's deity was pleased to dwell in him. So Jesus cannot, based on the whole counsel of God, be communicating anything here that would lead us to conclude anything less than he is God, he is Lord, he is supreme, he is righteous. So if that is the case, then why does Jesus answer this man by asking the man, why do you call me good? There's no one good except for God. Well, don't you know that the answer of Jesus is rooted in what he already understands about this man and about this man's condition and the barriers that this man has to receive what he came on, this quest to receive, the gift of eternal life. So Jesus responds to this man based on how the man addressed him. The man had not come to Jesus as God incarnate. The man had come to Jesus as good teacher or good rabbi. He had come to Jesus, not as God, but as a mere man. Now, rabbi was a position of honor and respect. And it explains why the rich man, when he came, would have bowed down at the feet of Jesus. But there, Jesus was not the only rabbi. 
there were many rabbis in that time period who were teaching people uh, their, what they believed uh, the right interpretation of the scriptures was for the way of God. And these rabbis, though it was an elevated position of honor and respect, these rabbis were flawed people. They were not the perfect, righteous, incarnate God. They were flawed people. And the rich young man was not coming to Jesus as God incarnate. He was coming to Jesus as rabbi. He reveals that in his first two words, good teacher, good rabbi, what must I do? And in that context of relating to Jesus, not as God, but as a rabbi, the rich young ruler calls Jesus good. Well, there's a problem with the rich young ruler's understanding of what it truly means to be good. And Jesus responds accordingly. From the start, Jesus is trying to help this man see his barrier to receiving eternal life. The the man believed that he could obtain eternal life through his own goodness. He saw the rabbis as good and he saw himself as good. You know, both Jesus and the rich young ruler use that word good in their opening phrases in this exchange with one another. It's the same word, but the definition of the rich young ruler for the word good and the definition of Jesus for the word good are two entirely different definitions. It's one of those moments like you keep using that word good. I do not think that word means what you think that it means kinds of moments. When the rich man said good, he was talking about what I'll label here, relative goodness, a relative kind of goodness, a kind of goodness that defines itself by looking at your own goodness and then looking at the goodness of others and comparing and determining what you think is good. We do this all the time. In fact, I would say this is the most common ways that humans tend to use the word good. We look at others and then we look at ourselves or we look at one person and then we look at another person and we make judgments between ourselves and between them. And then we label certain people good based on our own terms of whatever that word might be. It's a relative term. What we mean is that as people generally go, that one's a pretty good person. That's what we mean. And that's what the rich young ruler meant here. We do the same thing with our pets. I mean, people say, I have a good dog. When they say, I have a good dog, what are they saying? Are they saying, my dog has reached this elevated plane of morality and lifestyle that whenever I'm really struggling to understand something in my life, I can go to my dog and and it's trustworthy that if I'll just do what my dog does and listen to what my dog says, then I can learn what genuine goodness looks like. No, we mean that it's relatively a good dog. As dogs generally go, that one's a decent, it doesn't pee on my floor. It comes when I call it. It doesn't bite the mailman. It's a decent, it's a good dog. That's what we mean. So the rich young man's definition of good was different than Jesus's definition of good because when he said good, he was talking about relative goodness. But Jesus, when he said the word good, he meant something entirely different. He was not speaking about relative goodness. He was speaking of genuine goodness. What good really is. The kind of goodness that according to the Bible only exists in God and only can come from God. It exists nowhere else. And there truly is no one good except for God. And as God incarnate, Jesus was good, but he knew the man didn't know that yet. The man didn't realize it, but the reality was, and Jesus wanted to help him understand, was that his own goodness and the goodness of everyone else falls miserably short when it comes to the standard of God's genuine goodness. So the Bible tells us that the law of God was given to us as a tutor. It was given to us as a guide. God gave it one of its blessings. One of its features is that when we read the law of God, it helps us understand our own condition. It makes us aware of our unrighteousness and our sinful condition and elevates our understanding of just how genuinely good God is. And this explains why Jesus continues on. What does he do next? He presents the commandments. 
He presents a few of the commandments from the law of God to the man as a tutor to try to help this man understand, hey, you're missing the mark when it comes to this definition of the word good. You're using it the wrong way. Let me show you what good really looks like. And so Jesus employed the law to tutor the man and said, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. So he's tutoring him, guiding him in what genuine goodness looks like. But do you know that these commands have the exact opposite effect on the man that the law of God is intended to have on his soul? Instead of driving him to his awareness of his unrighteousness and his sin and his need for God, it's like this man almost breathes this audible sigh of relief. (sighs) Is that all that I have to do to inherit eternal life? And he answers, Jesus, all these I have kept since my youth. Oh, come on now. Are you serious? Are we really supposed to believe this guy? All these I have kept since since this man was a child, he's kept all these commandments. He never bore false witness and told a single lie. Is that what we're supposed to? I mean, he's lying right here in this text. (laughs) that he has never defrauded anyone, that he became wealthy in this world and didn't defraud a single person, that he had never stolen anything, even when he was a child, that he had always, that if we went to his mom and dad and said, hey, has this guy always honored you? They would say, never once did he dishonor us. He's just the perfect kid. You know, and these are all the external issues. Apparently this rich young ruler missed the Sermon on the Mount or fell asleep during it or something uh, because not only does Jesus tell us that when God is judging genuine goodness, these are just the external factors. Jesus tells us that God looks at our hearts, not just the outside, but the inside when it comes to genuine goodness. If he had listened to the Sermon on the Mount, he would have known that Jesus communicated that if a man gets angry, or has hatred in his heart towards another, that in the eyes of God, he has a murderous heart. Or that if a person looks on lust with another person, that in his heart, God sees an adulterous heart. And these are just the external things. It doesn't even include the condition of his heart. The man in this story, the rich young ruler, was clearly proud. What is pride? Well, one way to think about pride is that pride is when we have an overinflated view of ourselves. And this man had an overinflated view of his own goodness. He thought that his goodness could earn for him eternal life. Just tell me what works to do, Jesus, and I'll do them so that I can have eternal life. Well, in spite of his pride, Mark tells us that Jesus looked on the man and loved him. Isn't that a great window into the heart of God? I'm really grateful for that little phrase that Mark included in this story. What a window into God's heart that even when I'm proud, even when I have an overinflated view of my own goodness, God still looks upon me and loves me. In love, Jesus saw past this man's flaw and right into the deeper needs of his soul. This man had built for himself a kingdom in this world that Jesus recognized he loved more than the kingdom of God. So Jesus offered him a kingdom exchange. You know, Jesus doesn't go around and tell everybody they have to sell all they have and give it to the poor. But with this rich young ruler, after encountering him a few moments and he's God and reading right into the need of this man and his barrier to receiving eternal life, Jesus tells him, you lack one thing, go Sell all that you have and give to the poor. And then what does he tell them? And you will have treasure in heaven. That's a kingdom exchange right there. Give up your goods in this world and receive the goods of the kingdom. And then he gives the discipleship call. 
and come, follow me. Oh, that echoes the call that he gave to Peter and John and Andrew and James on the shore when they what? Dropped all their stuff, left their families and followed Jesus. What an invitation Jesus was extending to this rich young ruler. Now, we need to make sure we understand that Jesus was not prescribing a work for this man to get done. If he sells all of his stuff, then he'll have eternal life and treasures in heaven. This was not a work being assigned for the man to earn himself a passage into eternal life. No, this was Jesus looking on the condition of his heart and recognizing this man needed a kingdom exchange. This man needed to give up his kingdom in this world in exchange for the kingdom of God. It was a call to renounce all that he owns in his own kingdom and pledge allegiance to King Jesus and choose to follow him. You know, there's a heresy woven throughout church history and it's potent in the American church today that somehow we can receive eternal life without a change in our allegiance. This would have been ludicrous to Jesus and his disciples. That we can pledge our allegiance to our own kingdoms and still receive eternal life. Jesus did not separate the issue of receiving eternal life from receiving the kingdom of God. To receive eternal life was to receive the kingdom of God. And to receive the kingdom of God was to receive eternal life. Now make no mistake about it, there are no works we can perform to earn our way through our own goodness into that kingdom. But there is a pledge of allegiance that must change from the kingdoms of this world to the kingdom of God. And when the rich young ruler asked Jesus how to receive eternal life, Jesus doesn't tell him how to receive eternal life, Jesus tells him, gives him an invitation to exchange his kingdom for the kingdom of God. By receiving God's kingdom, the man would receive eternal life. That was the way that the man must receive it. So here it is, Jesus gives this call. What a wonderful invitation. And how did the man reply? Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. He had built for himself a kingdom in this world that he loved very much. So Jesus continued, looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. In his response, Jesus does acknowledge that it's difficult for all people to enter into the kingdom of God, but that it is especially difficult for those who have great possessions in this world. The more you have here, the harder it is. Why is that? Well, we've already seen the kingdom of God is so much better than any kingdom that we could have in this world. The kingdoms of Bill Gates and Elon Musk are puny little kingdoms compared to the kingdom of God. But what Jesus is acknowledging here is that the more you have in this world, the harder it will be for you to see the value of exchanging this kingdom for his kingdom. So how is it impossible for us to receive the kingdom of God? Through the story of the rich young ruler, Jesus shows us that no one can inherit the kingdom of God based on their own goodness. And that the more we have in this world, in our own kingdoms here, the harder it will be for us to recognize the value, the inherent worth of the kingdom of God and exchanging our kingdoms for his kingdom. So that's the first question. And there's one more question. How must a person receive the kingdom of God? If it's impossible through our own goodness, if it's impossible to buy our way into the kingdom or to keep our kingdoms here and receive that kingdom there, then how must a person receive the kingdom of God? And Jesus answers this question in the preceding story of him welcoming the little children. Recall that the disciples would have turned the children away. But Jesus was indignant about that. 
and he welcomes them. And then he uses that experience as an opportunity to teach his disciples what a person must do to receive the kingdom of God. Jesus says to his disciples, let the, little, the children come to me. Do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. He's telling us how we must receive the kingdom of God. We must receive it like a little child. The disciples would have turned the children away. And Jesus said, oh, no, no, no. You need to become like them or you're not gonna have any part in my kingdom. So what does it mean to receive the kingdom of God like a child? Small children are constantly aware of just how dependent they are on their parents for everything. The life of the child is tied to the life of their parents. Their first thought when they're hungry or thirsty is, where's mom or dad? Their first thought when they're in danger is to run to their parent for safety. If you ever had the experience as a child of getting left in a store and your parents leaving you, you can probably imagine the panic that set in and recall it to this day, how your life was tied to the life of your parent. Their first thought when they are in pain is to run to their parent for comfort. Their first thought when they want to know something is not to go to Google, it's to go to their parents and ask their, and they receive the word of their parent gladly, not because their parents created a 64 point PowerPoint presentation with a lot of logic and reasoning, but simply because the word came from their parent. A child's relationship with its parent is a great example of what it looks like for Jesus to be the ruler of our hearts. Jesus taught his disciples that, oh, you cannot earn your way into the kingdom through your own goodness. You can't work hard enough or have enough money to enter the kingdom. If you are to receive the kingdom, you are going to have to receive it like a small child. You would have to receive it by recognizing that your life is completely tied to the life of Jesus. You're gonna have to drop your own kingdom so that your arms are wide open and you can lay hold of the king. That is the only way to receive the kingdom of God. You know, our very own Tom Hill uh, is a Marine pilot, flew uh, in a fighter pilot as a fighter pilot with the Marines. You know, the Marine doesn't pilot, a Marine doesn't pilot a jet and then later on down the line decide if they wanna pledge allegiance to the United States military or not. That's totally backwards. A Marine pledges allegiance to the United States military and then they learn to pilot a jet. The same is true about the kingdom of God. We're not assigned the tasks that God wants to give us and the good works that we are gonna perform beforehand. What comes first is a pledging of allegiance to King Jesus. The Bible talks about it this way, prof professing with our mouths that he is Lord and believing in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. It's what Jesus was talking to the rich young ruler about here. Trade in all you're living for now in order to have my kingdom. A person does not enter uh, the kingdom by doing a job and performing the works and then later pledging allegiance to the kingdom. A person enters the kingdom by pledging allegiance to King Jesus and then they're assigned the task that the Lord has called them to do and they're empowered to do it. According to Jesus, the only way to receive his kingdom is for you to receive it like a small child. We must recognize that our lives are tied to Jesus and pledge our allegiance to the king. Receiving the kingdom means letting go of everything we have in this world in exchange for the kingdom of God. So that's the two stories and the lessons that Jesus wanted us to learn about how a person must receive the kingdom of God. And these stories beg us to ask the question, what kingdom do I love the most? In fact, we can tell when we look at the end of this story that that's the exact idea stirring around in the hearts and the heads of the disciples after having these encounters with Jesus. Recall how the disciples respond after Jesus teaches them the difficulty of entering into the kingdom of God. Remember what they said? 
And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? If this rich young ruler who seems to have his life together can't be saved, Jesus, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. You see, Jesus knew something that his disciples did not yet know. Jesus knew that they were about to go into Jerusalem. And he knew that as the king of the kingdom, he was going to give up his life for the sins of the world and for the sins of those disciples. That he would hang on a cross as the all sufficient sacrifice, the perfect lamb of God who shed his blood to atone for the sins of the world. And that he would take your sins and my sins upon himself and that they would bury him in a tomb and our sins would go to the grave with Jesus. But three days later, death would not hold him. The grave would not keep, keep him. But by the power of God, Jesus would rise again from the dead, proving that he has power over sin and over death. And these same disciples who floundered when those events were first unfolding would now see the resurrected Jesus and find new courage. They would watch as he ascended into heaven where he is now seated at the throne of the right hand of God, ruling as king of this kingdom. King of kings and Lord of lords. And that he would send his Holy Spirit to come and indwell every person who pledges allegiance to the king, who determines to give up what they have in this life in exchange for the kingdom of God. His spirit would come and dwell in them and that's what would bring the kingdom here. The kingdom of God is dwelling in the hearts of men and women who have pledged allegiance to their king. Jesus knew this was about to unfold and he wanted his disciples to begin to understand this. And Peter must have been starting to get the lesson a little bit because right after Jesus says these words and that it's only possible with God, Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. There's a stirring in his heart. And he's evaluating what kingdom does he love the most? Well, he left his family. He left his job. He left his possessions. He dropped it all to embrace the way of the king. See, Jesus, we've left it all. And Jesus said, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sister or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. It's an interesting response here from Jesus. What are we to make of this? Well, Jesus first affirms that the kingdom, those who exchange their kingdom for God's kingdom, that they, and they leave their homes, their families, their land for the sake of the gospel, that the kingdom is not this distant, far out thing, that the kingdom is now. We see that in what Jesus says. He says that there is no one who has left these things who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and family and lands with persecutions. And I looked at that at first and I thought, how do we make sense of this? If Jesus had said, if I exchange things in this world, then in heaven, I will have a mansion. That makes more sense to my brain, you know? And we know that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us, but that's not what Jesus says in response to Peter in this story. He doesn't say you're gonna get a future mansion. That's in a different passage. Jesus says, you're gonna get these benefits of houses and lands and family a hundredfold now in this time. What is that? Once again, Jesus is affirming that the kingdom is not some future concept. The kingdom is here and the kingdom is now. And those who receive the kingdom now also receive right now the family of God. We inherit the family of God. We share all that we have in common, our houses and our possessions for the sake of the kingdom and those who are our brothers and sisters in the kingdom. We are the only family that really matters because we're not just a blood family. We are a spiritual family and we will be the children of God forever. And whoever exchanges their kingdom in this world for the kingdom of God immediately receives a hundredfold 
a thousandfold brothers and sisters and mothers and lands and possessions. We receive a new land, a new nationality, a new citizenship as children of the king. God's kingdom is not just a distant concept, church family. The kingdom of God is here and now. And those who receive it, receive all the blessings and the benefits of the kingdom with persecutions. Didn't Jesus tell us in this world, we will have trouble with persecutions? But he said, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. We may face challenges and struggles in our lives. And maybe we can't prevent those from happening, but we can certainly be there for each other in the midst of those challenges and struggles. And everyone who receives the kingdom receives that family right here and right now. I wonder if that really excited you just now. Like if you were ready to stand up and pump your fist in the air and just jump and praise and yell and scream how grateful you are that the kingdom has come in you and that you get to share in these blessings right now. If it didn't excite you a lot, then I wonder why, why is that? Why does that message not just get you pumped up this morning? Could it be? because we're a lot more like the rich young ruler than we might think? Could it be because we've all set up our own little comfortable kingdoms inside the four walls of our homes that have captured our affections more than the blessings of the kingdom of God? That we love our houses and our lands more than we love his kingdom ruling in our hearts and sharing in his kingdom. How do we share in it? It's in you. It's in you, it's in you, it's in me. We share in the kingdom when we're together. You know, I've often heard people recount three or four or five times that they were together with God's people in a single week. And then they follow that recalling of how many times they were together for something at church with some phrase like, and it's just way too much. Whoo, it's just way too much. Our words are revealing about what we truly value the most. Do we not realize that as soon as the Holy Spirit came to indwell his followers at Pentecost and they received the indwelling of the Spirit and became part of that kingdom, that their immediate practice was to meet daily in the temple and house to house? That those first Christians met twice a day and they didn't say, and it's just so much. They ate their food with gladness and received each other with glad hearts. Why? Because they had dropped everything to pledge allegiance to the king and there was nothing that brought them greater joy than being part of the kingdom. Now, I'm not saying that we have to arrange our schedules to always meet twice a day, but what I am saying is the words that come out of your mouth will reveal what's truly in your heart. And perhaps, maybe, if we would turn off those blinking little screens in our homes for a little while that we use to console and entertain and comfort us so often, we might recognize how much time we are wasting inside our own little comfortable kingdoms that we've built for ourselves in this world. And we might realize just how much we're missing out on experiencing the blessings of the kingdom of God by being together and carrying out his mission together. What a call that Jesus gave that rich young ruler follow me. A call to relationship, a call to proximity, a call to exchange his kingdom and get the best kingdom that that guy could ever possibly imagine or dream of. And what a blessing for those of us in this room who are not wealthy in this world. We exchange our puny little kingdoms here and we immediately get the riches and the blessings of this kingdom of God on the earth. Honestly, You've got to ask yourself, what kingdom has been capturing the affections of my heart the most? Would you bow in prayer with me for just a moment? And I'm going to ask our response team if they would come forward at this time. I imagine two different kinds of people wrestling with this message this morning. I think there's probably some in this room who have never at any point in their life exchanged their love for their own kingdom, for the kingdom of God. I gotta ask, is that you? Let me be clear on that. You've never professed Jesus as Lord. You've never, you're like the rich young ruler. You've been proud. You think your own goodness might earn your way to a right spot with God in heaven and eternal life. 
You've never recognized your need for Jesus to save you of your sin. Perhaps you've never decided to renounce all you own and follow Jesus as your king. Well, if that's you today, I wanna invite you to come, to come forward in just a moment when I give the invitation and to tell one of these leaders, I'm ready for the kingdom exchange. I wanna give up everything that I have to follow King Jesus. So is that you this morning? Do you need to start the relationship with Jesus, your King? You've got a choice to make. The rich young ruler thought his life was more valuable than the life Jesus was offering. So he went away sad. You can leave this place this morning and walk away from the invitation for the kingdom exchange. But I wanna urge you that the best life you could ever have is not found in any kingdom you can build in this world, but it's found in giving up all you have in exchange for the king. And there's another type of person in this room. When you reflect on your history, you know you've already received the kingdom. There's been a time in your life when you said, Lord, you can have it all. I will follow you. You have tied your life to the life of Jesus. But maybe through this example of the rich young ruler, you're recognizing right now some way that the affections of your heart have drifted towards the things of this world and right now have presently outgrown the affections for the kingdom of God. Is that you? Has some part of the kingdom that you've created in this world replaced in your affections, the kingdom of God? Have idols crept into your life that have caused you to miss out on experiencing the blessings of God's kingdom right now? And the joy of being together with the children of the King. If that is you, then in just a moment, when I give this invitation, I wanna invite you to come forward for prayer, to not walk away from here sorrowful or downcast, but to walk away from here knowing that once again, you drove a stake in the ground and you said, as of today, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord and all we have will belong to the King. That's the two types of people in this room and that's the invitation that we need to receive this morning. So whether you need to give it all up for the first time or whether you see a need to restir your heart to the affections of the kingdom over the kingdom of this world, this invitation is for you. Would you please stand with me at this time? And we're gonna sing during this invitation. And as we sing, I wanna ask you, to be courageous, to not walk away, but to walk right here to the front and to say, there's an affection that needs to change in my heart. I'm ready for it all to belong to the King. Let's sing this song together. And as we do, you come at this time. Lord, you are more precious than silver. about the affections of our heart belonging to the King. Let the Lord work in your heart this morning. If there's something that has elevated itself above Him, just come and say, Lord, I give it to you. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly Nothing I desire 
compares with you. Let's continue to express our heart to the King and several have come forward for prayer, but there are still some that are ready to receive you. So you come forward and let's continue to share our affections with the King. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. said amen it is good to turn the affections of our hearts towards our king and i hope that no one will leave this place who isn't sure that they've already pledged allegiance to king jesus i want to encourage you as you go how would the lord have you use something that is within your stewardship but remember it doesn't really belong to you that money in your bank account that nice house that you're living in, that car that you're driving, how would the Lord have you use it this week to make an investment in his kingdom? Is there somebody you could pick up? Is there somebody you could buy, buy them lunch today? Maybe he wants you to give a gift to finish building B or towards the ministries of the local church or give up some time and welcome someone in your home and serve them a meal so that they would be blessed and you could show hospitality for the kingdom. What does the Lord want you to do personally to just take this puny little stuff we have here and apply it to the magnificent kingdom of God? And before you go, I wanna invite you back to come back next week. We've got a treat next week. And I think we have a slide that we can put up on this, Eric, but it is Reaching Souls International Sunday. We'll send out a little bit of more information about it, uh, but we're gonna have Pastor Charles here from Africa, um, uh, Charles Chingala. And he is going to be speaking to us next week about the call of God to reach the nations and the call of God to make disciples. And I promise you the perspective he's gonna bring is unique because he's not doing the work of the kingdom that we are all called to do no matter we live in America. He's doing that work right now in Africa. And that's gonna bring with it some unique perspectives about what it looks like for us to yield our lives in service to the King. Um, Pastor Charles, he oversees many, many national missionaries, has helped plant many uh, different churches, and the Lord has used him to see many people come to Jesus. And so I'll send out some information, some more information about him this week, but I want you to be able to mark your calendar and start planning now. Let's be back next Sunday. And then Otis Compton from Reaching Souls International, who is a friend of many of ours here, he will be here as well with Pastor Charles. So it's gonna be a great week next week. We invite you to come back. Thank you for being here this morning. Go in peace, you are blessed and you are dismissed.